Now, we're going back to the Bible issue here in just a minute, but uh, when I mentioned to you about the Apostle Paul as the Apostle to the Gentiles, this is what I'm saying. I wish I could draw. If I could draw, what I'd do is, is I'd draw you a pair of glasses here. And I'd say this is the Pauline epistles. Stop laughing at my drawing. Amen. Send me to an art class. No, I don't have time. <laughs> and I did uh, camp last week with ours and then just finished that one up there in Indiana and Amen. got back today and leave the prison. I don't know when I'd work it in. That's the stuff that you would view the entire Bible through. Now, that's a silly illustration, but if that's the glasses, you, you view the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, through the Pauline epistles. Not to be confused with people that are called hyper-dispensationalists and all they use is Paul's prison epistles. They eliminate baptism and the Lord's Supper. They're called ordinances. And they're ordinances in the local church. They're not sacraments. Amen. Ordinance in the local church is the Lord's Supper. That's what we do. Remember his death till he comes. They eliminate baptism. Paul said, I came not to baptize but to preach the gospel. He didn't say he didn't baptize. He's saying that I didn't come to preach the same gospel that Peter preached, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. He's saying that's not my gospel. I came to preach the gospel, how that Christ died for your sins according to Scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, buried, raised again the third day according to the Scripture. So that's what we're talking about. When you talk about right divisions, that's what you're talking about. And then baptism. Baptism after. Good testimony of a good conscience toward God for something that has already happened in your life. Baptism doesn't save you. But it's good. It doesn't baptize you into the local church. That's where you get a thing called brighter theology. Brighter theology is simply this. They believe unless you've been baptized by an independent Baptist preacher who they think uh, ascends or descends from the uh, line of John the Baptist, going all the way back to John the Baptist, in an independent Baptist church, of course, they're the ones that tell you which independent pastor and which independent church. And unless you're baptized by them, you're not in the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, which is foolishness. Amen. You get in the bride of Christ by salvation. Amen. You don't get in by baptism. You don't get in through a church. You get in through a person. Amen. Are you a person? Amen. How can a building save you? Amen. How can a religion save you? Amen. How can an animal sacrifice save you? You need a person to save you. Amen. That's just common sense. You say, what? Jesus Christ. He's a person. Amen. And that's what, how that Christ died for your sins, according to the Scripture, was buried and raised again the third day. All right, now these passages, and you can look them up if you'd like to. We may go over a few of them here. Romans chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. If you want to write these down, these are the passages that show you the Apostle Paul is the Apostle to the Gentiles. A fellow said to me one time, we don't follow a man. You better follow Paul or you're going to be in a train wreck. <laughs> Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Right. Don't tell me you don't follow a man. You have kids, they follow you, don't they? Yes, sir. What do you want your kids to say to you the next time you say, clean up your bedroom and come down to breakfast? We don't follow a man. <laughs> See how stupid that sounds? Amen. And you go to your teachers, uh, kids uh, get ready to go back to school here in another few weeks, and they get up there and the teacher says, okay, class, I want you to shut up. And one of them stands up and says, we don't follow a man. I'll give you a better one than that. How's this? Go to work tomorrow. And when your boss says, all right, everybody, staff meet at 9 o'clock, be there. We don't follow a man. <laughs> Try that on him. How come that thing only creeps in when it comes to church? Amen. That's strange to me. You do follow a man as he follows Christ. If a man has the Bible and he's rightly dividing the Bible, then you're perfectly okay. He doesn't become your mentor. He doesn't become the, the person whom you follow. If he's following Christ, he's simply showing you, walking in the same direction. He's ahead of you a little bit. You just follow him. It looks like it's working out pretty good for him, so I follow him. It's just, it, it's just strange to me how people apply things like that everywhere else. You don't need to be nice to people and stuff like that when they come to church. But if they don't greet you when you walk in the door at Walmart or a restaurant or something, you get mad as a hornet. 
Why don't you be nice to people when they come here? Amen. I have a passage we'll cover today. Aren't you glad I'm home? <laughs> I have a passage I'm going to cover today where he commands you in the Bible to be courteous. Yes, sir. Right. Right. To be courteous. Amen. Amen. That means you've got to be nice to people. That's right. Amen. You're, you're funny. You think you, come to, you, you think you come to church and you don't have to be nice to people. The Bible says you're supposed to be nice to them. I know. Oh, I get it. I just, I just got it. Thank you, Lord. You're nice to people when you get something out of it. That's right. Well, that's right. That's why you want to be greeted at Walmart because you're going to be spending some dollars there and you want to know they appreciate your business. That's how it is. I, I get that. Uh, Galatians chapter 2. I'll leave these up here for you. I've, I've got a sweet message for you this morning. A real, real, real gem. It's a real sweet one. You'll enjoy it. I promise. I'm not setting you up. It's, it's, it's nice. It's about, it's about peace, love, and Woodstock, man. <laughs> First Corinthians four sixteen, and First Corinthians eleven. All right. Now you can. I'll give you the time if you want to to write those down. If you have questions about that stuff, then I'd be more than happy to answer the questions. Like I said, we've been over it before, but I, I refer to it a lot. And don't let that ever hinder you from asking a question. We have a lot of new people that are here. And uh, I, I say things about rightly dividing. And when I say stuff about rightly dividing, I'm talking about 2 Timothy 2.15. Where you find in all your perversions, the word study is taken out. That's right. What you have a responsibility as a pastor to do is, is to what's called feed the sheep. Well, I can't feed you corn and potatoes and wheat and whatever all sheep eat, I guess, grass and that kind of a thing. I'm supposed to feed you spiritual food. So I'm supposed to show you what the Bible says about things so that you can come to your own conclusions. You don't follow it because I say it. You follow it because the Bible says it. Right. I'm just supposed to turn the light on it for you. So when we talk about right divisions, the word over here is, is to study to show you, not, not give attendance to, not do your diligence and that. Study. You've got to study it. There's more to church than just coming to church and sitting there on your blessed assurance. And there's more to the Bible than just quit, stop, don't, and go do, and go get, and go be, and all that. It's learn some things about the one that saved you. Amen. He gave you a Bible for more than just to reach other people. It's to help you. Amen. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path personal. It's not about everybody else. Yeah, right. yeah. You get the right relationship with Jesus Christ, and then you get the other, this other stuff takes care of itself. But just so that you know, if you're new here, we follow the Pauline epistles. Now, that doesn't mean we don't preach out of the Bible. I'll be in a number of places in the Bible this morning. We'll start in Psalms 119, and then we'll go over to, uh, to 2 Peter, and then we'll come back over to Philippians chapter 4, and then we'll be in Luke chapter 8. And when you get all those passages together, you say, well, that's not all Pauline epistles, but there's nothing that I will give you that will conflict Pauline epistles. So when we talk about in 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which they change in the new uh, versions, they got an angel flying around in Revelation 14 there. They change angel to eagle. A talking eagle going around giving the everlasting gospel. <laughs> Somebody's got that eagle as being a type of the United States and they're dropping tracks out of an airplane giving the gospel in the tribulation. That's the, I, I don't know how people can get that stuff. It says angel. You say, what? It, it's an angel preaching the gospel. You know where they get the passage? They, they say, well, it can't, the word can't be angel because Paul says, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than that which we preach, let him be accursed. So that can't be an angel because the everlasting gospel is the same as the gospel of the grace of God. So it must not be an angel. It must be an eagle and that must be something wrong. No, it's the everlasting gospel. It says, fear God and he's coming. Amen. And it's not the same way you're saved. Amen. Right. So I believe, you know, I'm looking back to the cross. You're not looking for anything. You're looking for the second coming of Christ and you're shaking in your boots saying... Have mercy on me, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. When you come down here and split the sky and the Mount of Olives splits there and you go down to the Battle of Decision, the Battle of Megiddo, the Battle of uh, Armageddon there in the Valley of Megiddo and the Battle of Armageddon, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. Amen. That's not what you do. You come to Jesus Christ as a sinner. Yeah. It's strange. When you, when you come to Jesus Christ to get saved, you confess you're a sinner. Yeah. 
But to stay in fellowship, you confess your sins. It's a difference. Uh, when you get saved, you don't have to confess, Lord, I'm a sinner and I'm, I've messed up again, re-saved me. After you, I mean, after you do that to get saved. But when you get saved to stay in fellowship, you don't have to say, I'm a sinner. You have to confess your sins. Right, what would you do? And that kind of thing. So if you want to, you take the time to look these things up. Maybe you'd like to mark them in your Bible or make you a little chain or something like that. When somebody says, you know, well, what's your authority? Now, these passages right here, when you talk about Pauline epistles... You're talking about Romans to Philemon. Those are the ones that Paul wrote. You say, well, the Apostle Paul probably wrote the book of Hebrews. He probably did. You don't know that definitively for sure, but he probably did. But the book of Hebrews doesn't apply to you. The book of Hebrews, there's some things in there that you can use, and there's some good stuff in there. There's some great stuff in there about a better high priest and better than the angels and better than this and better than a sacrifice and all that. But there's also a lot of passage in there where you can lose your salvation. So if you don't view the book of Hebrews through this, you think somebody can lose their salvation. And that's as simple a way as I know how to put it. That's important for you to grab a hold of. So if you run into a passage, uh, you read in the book of Acts where he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. You go over there to the book of Corinthians, and Paul says, The gospels, Christ died for your sins, buried, raised again the third day. You go by Paul. The Apostle Paul says tongues are gone, tongues have ceased. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Okay, why? The Apostle Paul told you why. It says that, that uh, Jews require a sign, Greeks seek after wisdom. Amen. Not prefer a sign. Right. Request a sign. Require. In order to convince a Jew, he's got to see a sign. You don't want to do that. So when Paul, the Apostle Paul, when you read over in the book of Hebrews, it's impossible to new them again to repentance. I'm reading uh, or quoting Hebrews chapter 6. It's impossible to new them again under repentance who have once tasted the good word of God and so on and so forth and have once have fallen away and they can't get resaved and all that. That has to do with the Apostle Paul coming in and says, you're sealed to the day of redemption. Now which is it? Go by Paul. This, this becomes the authority. It's not that the Bible... The whole Bible is not good for you as far as that's concerned. But when it comes to those matters, doctrinal matters, you go by the Apostle Paul. That's your authority. Is that right? Brother Brad's looking at that. That's an H, Brother Brad. Do I do all right? Okay. All right. So that, that's what we believe here. If you're new here, that's what we teach. Don't let these people scare you when they say, you know, oh, they're dispensationalists over there. It's a Bible word. Amen. Paul said a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. It's a, dis it's a dispensing. It's, it's simply this. Uh, let's say Woodford. Woodford here, I did it again. Let's say uh, Woodford, Woodard, Woodard and his wife, Jennifer, have uh, uh, two children. They have Emma and they have Manning. Emma's a little bit older. You don't give Emma the same food you give Manning, and you don't give Manning the same stuff you give Emma, not right now. You say, why? They're different ages. One's got teeth and one doesn't as they grow. It doesn't mean that they don't both get food. It means that there's certain food for certain ones. All a dispensation is is different food for different people at a different time. That's all it is. It just means God manifested himself differently to Noah than he manifests himself to you. Amen. Let me see the hands of everybody in here that God came to you and told you to build a boat. You raise your hand. Oh, there's nobody in here. Well, he did him. Let me see the hands of all you in here. Where he took you out there and showed you the stars and he says, uh, do you believe that your son's going to be uh, as the stars of the heavens and as the great as the sands of the sea? Well, it was accounted unto him for righteousness for believing that, not the death, burial, and the resurrection. So what do I do? I view that. That's a great type. It's a great story, but I view that through that right there, Romans to Philemon. You with me? So now what happens is, is that's important because there's a lot of passages that if you're not careful that deal with this right here. And this is a big thing right now. Please pardon my writing. Y'all need entertainment anyway. <clears throat> this is the big one right here, and then I'll get on with this other stuff. If you don't view your Bible from this point right here, then that'll put your church in that right there. 
all verses that have to do with the church going in the tribulation, every verse that has to do with the church in the tribulation, there's none of them in that. They're all outside of that. Every verse about losing salvation is not in here, it's somewhere else. Every verse about eternal security, it's right here. The other ones, it's conditional. You're the only one that's sealed to the day of redemption. So, so when you get into those passages, you say, you know what? Those, that's real stuff. I believe it. I believe it 100%. No question about it in my mind. I just know it's not for me. Amen. Because these right here are written to a unique group of individuals called the church. You're not a spiritual Jew. You're not engrafted into the Jewish. You're a Christian. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free, male nor free male in the body of Christ. Amen. So I'm not a spiritual Jew, and I don't inherit spiritual Jewish promises. Amen. So I've got to find out, what do I get, Paul? I get things that Paul said I get. Church age doctrine. That's right. Now, that doesn't mean you cut out the rest of the Bible. But that will help you so much when you read a passage in the Bible, and you say, you know, these are they which had the, uh, that kept the commandments and had the faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, my goodness. If I don't keep the Ten Commandments, I'm lost. What does Paul say about the Ten Commandments? Romans chapter number 13, he gives you all the stuff that's done away. Colossians chapter number three, or 1 and 3 says he nailed the, the, the uh, law, to, uh, the ordinances to the cross and put them away from you. So in Leviticus, I can't eat shrimp and scampi and lobster and pork and all that in the New Testament, I can, if I can stomach it, I can ask the Lord to bless it and I can eat anything I want to eat. That would give you liberty. Not on, under an Old Testament law. Uh, I don't mean to be crude with you, but um, let, me, well, let me rephrase that. Let me think of a better way to put it. How many of you have on more than, your clothing is made of more than one kind of cloth this morning? Let me see your hand. You got on maybe cotton underneath, and then you got on whatever the wool or whatever, whatever this is made of or whatever. But, but in the Old Testament, that's forbidden. You can't wear garments of diverse makings. Any of you ever plant a garden? I know Woodard's planted a garden. And Brother Chase, but, you know, all right. Some of y'all planted a garden before. Uh, you can't put crops together in the same area. But in the New Testament, there's no law against it. The Lord's always talking about separation, trying to show them something in the Old Testament. You understand? By the way, Brother John, that stuff looks good out there where you pressure wash that. I appreciate that very much. I, that really looks nice. It makes a good impression when folks come up here. I know you probably people think, what's, what's the big deal? That's a big deal to me. I, I appreciate that. I really do. Thank you for doing that. Anyway, that's a simple overview. But I, I guess I heard uh, somebody was talking the other day that, you know, they said, well, what is a dispensation? What is a dispensationalist? Somebody said that. Here it comes. You ready? That's a cult. <laughs> Brother Peacock's the cult leader because he teaches dispensations. Amen. What? No, you, they call in, they label something they don't understand. Right. You study your Bible. You know what they said? They said, well, there's no way because people are saved the same way in the Old Testament they are in the New Testament. Okay, well, I don't even have time to argue with stupidity. <laughs> the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard of in your life. If you're saying the same way in the Old Testament you are in the New Testament, let me ask you this. Let's just look at the final destination to resolve it. How come they didn't go to the same place? Nobody in the Old Testament went to heaven when they died. You say, yes, they, they went to paradise. What makes you think paradise was up there? Well, that's heaven. No, it's not. Paul said, I was called up to the third heaven, and paradise was there. It's a place. But you've got to find out where it was before. Jesus hanging on the cross. Do you don't know what I'm talking about? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Good, few of you do. Here's the, Jesus is hanging on the cross. The thief looks at him and says, Lord, remember me when I come into thy kingdom. Not, I believe the death, the burial, the resurrection. Right. I believe you're the Messiah. Right. That's what was required. Right. Lord, remember me when I come to thy kingdom. Today. Not tomorrow. Today. Thou shalt be with me in... Okay, well, preacher, it's in heaven. Well, we got a problem. 
Mary? Yeah, third day resurrected. Mary? Uh, yes, Lord. Don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to the Father. How could he meet the thief in paradise and he hadn't ascended yet? Modern scholarship. You ready for it? Well, he had gone there, but he had yet to enter into the Holy of Holies to present the blood in order for the Father to see him. And therefore, we can know by the study of the inspired and fallible scriptures that as the Lord ascended into heaven, he took the thief. Ephesians 4, right? He that ascended... Is it not he that descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Matthew chapter 12. As Jonas was in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. How was he in there? Three days and three nights. You say, where was he? In the heart of the earth. He preached to the saints, I mean the, 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 the uh, angels and those that were already in hell. He comes across hotties. <laughs> And he crossed the great gulf fixed, and he comes into Abraham's bosom slash paradise. And he hangs out with them boys three days, and he says, y'all ready to get out of here? And they said, man, we've been waiting for this for a long time. And he said, well, they said, how are we going to get out? And he said, I got the keys. But you needn't worry about that because I'm the door. And up he comes, and they ascended. So it, that's, that's called right division. That makes your Bible make sense. Well, I've never heard anything like that before. Okay, I don't mean to be smart. It requires a little study. You've got to work at it a little bit. Some of you folks come from places that all they teach you every Sunday morning is another message on salvation. How many of you here are saved? Leave them up just a minute. Well, best I can tell, that's everybody in the room. Now, how do you need to know another message on being saved? think there's more to Jesus Christ than salvation? There's not that many verses on salvation in the Bible. Well, what's the rest of the Bible for? You're supposed to study and learn about Him. The one that saved you. Now that you're saved, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they're spiritually discerned, but he can know them how. But the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives you the knowledge of God, yea, the deep things of God. Now that you're saved, you can know things you couldn't know before you're saved. That's the beginning. The door's open now. You can learn everything you want to learn. Why? The Holy Spirit that wrote the book's inside you. Amen. So he's in here inside you, and he says, okay, learn some things about me. I'll show you. I'll teach you. I'll use the Bible, the Word. I'll use the preacher. I'll use those things to show you Amen. certain things. Amen. So that's what all that's about. You say, preacher, keep rehashing. Have you looked around lately how many new people we got here? Yes, sir. So if you don't rightly divide your Bible, you would be a train wreck all your life. And then you say, well, I just don't understand it. Well, don't give up on it. You go to your work tomorrow and you get, your boss tells you to do something. You say, well, I just don't understand it. Okay, you're fired. <laughs> you know what you say? Don't fire me. I'll learn it. That's right. Because that's right. That's right. you want it bad enough because there's a paycheck in it. Well, let me just tell you this, and then I'll get to the thing on the Bible here. Now, I apologize. It's important to pull over and park. When somebody has a question, you can't just ignore that stuff. Amen. Right. It's important. That's, that can be the Lord using a, one individual to say, pull over and park and clear it up for everybody. That's right. Right. So you just like, stop for a minute. We ain't got no, like, a menu here. Like, you know, I'm not, you know, get my sermon off the Internet, and I've got to follow the thing, you know, and then here's your little handout for you to do that stuff. Pull over and park. Sometimes you just get up and, and, and preach about something like that, and somebody's like, that really helped me, and if you'd have preached what you had, it'd have been a stinking train wreck. <laughs> Amen, Brother Woodard? Amen. Thank you. Amen. Here's the thing you lose sight of. There is a reward for studying. Yeah. Yeah. Your boss tells you to learn a new job. Your kids have to learn things, and you don't expect them to... Mamas, you don't want to take care of your kid forever. Forever? some point in time, don't you want them to learn to brush their own teeth? Amen. And take care of other necessities? Amen. You don't want to go to the bathroom with them from now on? You want to sit there every time they sit down and, Come here, honey, let me cut your meat up. Come here, honey, let me do that. You want to do that from now on? What a drag, man. What do you think you got kids for? Cut the grass. I don't know how. You're going to learn. Amen. Cut the grass. 
I, well, but, but I don't know how. Well, let me show you. <laughs> you're going to learn how to do it. And sooner or later, you're going to do it without having me have to come out here and show you. So what happens here is, is that you lose sight of that right there. And when you lose sight of that right there, you think, well, there's no reason for me to study the Bible, to pray, and to try to understand what God's saying to me. And so your relationship with Jesus Christ does what we call stagnate. It just stops. You're still saved. Amen. But you're deader than 4 o'clock. Right. You say, why? You're not putting anything in. Right. You've lost sight of where you're headed. So if you don't keep that forever, it, if you don't keep the author and finisher of your faith, the Apostle Paul, I press toward the mark and the, and the high calling of God. I'm keeping my eye on the author and finisher of my faith. Why? You get your eyes off of him, you're headed for a train wreck. Right. You're trouble okay. all the way across. All right, I hope that helps you. That's a lot of chicken scratch up there, but there's a lot in those few words there. <coughs> All right, we got just a few minutes now. I want to finish this. Uh, I, I won't be able to finish it now, but I want to cover just a couple of more things here. Uh, look in 1 John chapter number 5. 1 John chapter number 5. And I'll show you where, uh, where your Bible, uh, your New King James Bible especially on this one, makes a, uh, a, a definitive statement. And uh, this is something important because it reveals a lot about the individuals that are, that are writing this stuff. 1 John chapter 5. Now, if you ever, uh, if you get saved here, if I have the opportunity to lead you to the Lord, and, or if you come to my office and say, Preacher, I want to ask you a question. I feel like I lost my salvation. I, I, feel like I, I feel like I'm not saved. Every time you feel like you're not saved, I can guarantee you one thing. It's because you're looking at what you did instead of what he said. Right. You never judge your salvation by what you do. Now, this goes against uh, the old-fashioned teaching of John chapter 15 that says, you know, if you abide in the vine, then he abides in you. And if you get out of the vine, he gets a pruning hook and cuts you out and throws you in the fire. And for years up until the 1950s, they taught that you could lose your salvation. So the whole bit about your salvation was, con was based on you abiding in the vine. Then what they did was is they would tell you what abiding in the vine is. Meaning that if you really were saved, then we see fruit in your life. That fruit was turned around to be, we see uh, church attendance, we see uh, tithing, we see Bible reading, we see uh, uh, you bringing other people in, we see you witnessing to other people and other people getting saved. That's not fruit anywhere in the Bible. The fruit of the Spirit is found in Galatians chapter 5 and there's nine of them. For an independent Baptist, there's ten. We add a tenth one there, and that's that critical spirit called fruit inspecting. <laughs> but there's nine according to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the Holy Spirit gives you nine fruits that are manifested out of an individual's life that's in fellowship with God. It comes out of the same passage in Galatians chapter number five that says, if you walk in the Spirit, then you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, Spirit against the flesh, you cannot do the things you want. But, if you don't walk in the Spirit, then the works of the flesh which are manifest are these. And he gives the list. And they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. There's nothing in that passage about salvation. The inheritance there has to do with the judgment seat of Christ. And then after he finishes that definitive statement, he jumps down and he says, now the fruit of the Spirit is... That means if you're in fellowship, that has nothing to do with being saved. A saved Christian cannot manifest a single fruit of the Holy Spirit. Come to Galatians chapter number 5 real quick. Let me just show you this. We'll come back to 1 John. This is important for you to get a hold of. You say, why? To get the shackles off of you. Take the pressure off. You're all, you, you know, what will happen is you try to act. You follow me? You try to act like a Christian. A Christian is not something you do, it's something you are. Man, you try to act like that. Tell me what I need to act like. We all have a tendency to follow the peer pressure. If everybody in here dresses a certain way and you're the oddball out, after a period of time, it'll generally have an effect on you and you'll generally sort of change because you want to be, you're clannish, you want to be like them, unless you're just a jerk. But, that, but <laughs> for the most part, you want to try to, when you go somewhere, you don't want to stand out. You generally don't want to walk in there and everybody's wearing blue and you walk in in pink. Amen. Especially if you're male. Amen. A lady Amen. told me one time, she says, you just have to be sure of your manhood to be pink. I said, I don't want them questioning my manhood. <laughs> I like ladies in pink, but I'm not wearing pink. Amen. If you've got on pink, God bless you. I'm glad you're secure in your manhood. Well, bless God. You know, your wife likes pink. She's 
dressed in you in pastel colors. You don't match. How come you didn't quit start wearing pink until you met her? Don't hand me that. Don't hand me that. You did not because the guys would have made fun of you. They'd be like, whoa, what's up with that? If you wear pink, God bless you. I'm not saying you're... you're <laughs> Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. What he gets across there, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh and the affections and the lust. The manifestation of those spirits, right, or those things right there, are a manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit in your life, and it says nothing at all about salvation. It's if you're in fellowship. If you're in fellowship with the Lord, you will produce that. And if you're not in fellowship with the Lord, you can still be saved, but you won't have it. If you're not in fellowship with the Lord, you know what the, one of the first things to go is? Your joy goes and your peace goes. But he promises you peace. What happened to the peace? Your fellowship's gone. You don't know the storm I'm in. We'll talk about that this morning. All right, back to 1 John chapter 5. What I'm trying to get across to you is when they mess with verses like this, they're messing with more than just words on a page. They're messing with doctrines. They're messing with some things the Lord's trying to show you and your authority. Therefore, they become the authority. Now, the Bible says in 1 John 5, we'll read it right the first time. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 13. These things have I written unto you. Bible. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Amen. All right? Those of you that are saved. That you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. Is it will, His will for you to be saved? Amen. All right? Then He hears your prayer to be saved. He gives you the passage up there. He says... Uh, he that hath the Son hath life. He that has not the Son of God hath not life. The wrath of God abideth upon him, right? All right. Now, in verse number 13, what they do is, is they change this. In verse number 13, they change it to read like this. Um, let me see if I can read it the right way. These things have I written unto you who believe the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. That you may continue to believe? Why would you add continue to? They tell you on a regular basis that one of the things that they do is, is they hold to, this is their famous thing, nobody ever checks them, we hold to the originals or we hold to the, the closest Greek text. Right? Amen. Problem, their uh, scholars on the New King James Committee, there's no Greek text anywhere, including the corrupt manuscripts that have those who continue. You just added that. Do you know why they added it? So that they can teach that if, if, if you're saved, you have to continue to be doing something. Because if you're saved, then we can see the evidence of your salvation by you doing what we think you ought to be doing. Amen. That's teaching works for salvation. That's te I mean, for, to maintain your salvation. Or evidence of your salvation. Any of you ever been around a real Calvinist? Can you just say amen while I don't have to turn around and look? You ever been around a real Calvinist? You know what that real Calvinist is always trying to do? The uh, little glasses thing fell off here. Um, you ever been around a real Calvinist? You know what they're always trying to do? They're trying to convince themselves they're always that they were the elect. You know what they look at to see if they're the elect? Do I read the Bible? Do I go to church? Do I do this? Do I do that? Do I not sin? Well, you're headed for trouble. That's one of the most definitive verses on salvation that there ever is right there. And what he says there is, is that you have eternal life based on what I wrote you, not based on anything you do. Amen. When you doubt your salvation, ladies and gentlemen, you're doubting what he said. You can't do it based on how you live. We all ought to live a good life. But if you look at sin the way God looks at sin, it is just as wicked to have wicked thoughts as it is to do the thoughts. It's just as wicked to have a gossiping tongue as it is to have a dancing foot. Amen. It's just as wicked to have wandering eyes as it is to be a drunk. Amen. So if you look at it that way, 
then none of us would be saved. Amen. Not for long. Amen. You get behind the wheel of a car, you can lose your salvation pretty quick. Amen. 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 And it don't even have to require somebody to pull in front of you. You hit a button and it doesn't work, or you hit the AC and the heater comes on. Amen. And I was like, how did that happen? I talked to a preacher yesterday. He called me. I just, had just landed and I was driving. He said, man, pray for me, preacher. Pray for me. I've lost my salvation. I said, what happened, brother? He's laughing, you know. I said, what happened? He said, man, he said, I went out the other day and I got in my truck and he said the air conditioner didn't work. And he said, man, I figured I was okay. You know, I'll ride with the windows down. He said, I got back home from work and he said, I got home. The air conditioner was out of my house. And he said, and then I own a rental property, and the air conditioner went out there. And he said, $10,000 later. I said, I'll pray for you, brother. I'll pray for you. <laughs> he said, why? Well, why would they want to change that, that passage? I can tell you why. Because their motive, their reason behind doing that is to try to keep you in bondage. I want you here because you love the Lord Jesus Christ. You should be faithful to him. You're not faithful to the church, you're faithful to him. You're not faithful to the pastor, you're faithful to him. If you're faithful to him, the rest of the stuff will take care of itself. I want people that, that, that love the Lord to be here, not people that are trying to prove anything else. I want my wife to stay with me because she loves me, not just when I'm lovable. I want somebody to love me when I ain't so lovable. Right? When you... Stink and you sweat and you don't look pretty. You ain't got on the foo foo juice and all that. By the way, I I do know I need a haircut. I'll get it when I can. I hadn't had time to even get a haircut lately. I about took a pair of scissors to it myself this morning. <laughs> it drives me crazy. I don't want to look like. <laughs> Never mind. All right, let's go on just a little further. We got a couple more minutes and I'll let you get out of here. Come if you will, please, over to Second uh, John chapter one. Second John chapter one. Now, I have, a, I have a real issue with this um, just because they do it on a regular basis. I believe the Bible is a spiritual book. I believe the Bible is about the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe the Bible is written by the Holy Spirit. And I believe the Holy Spirit is as much a part of the Trinity as God and, the, and Jesus Christ. I believe they're all equal parts. I believe when the Lord Jesus Christ puts his name in there, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Right? Pretty, pretty major deal. And then he says... I'll magnify my word above my name. Right. So his name pretty important. Would you agree with that? Yes. Then explain to me why in 2 John chapter number 1 and verse number 3, there's only one chapter, why would you take off this? Grace be unto you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, in true love. Why would you take Lord off? Do you know what his name is? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Amen. You just took the definitive part off of that and you just made him just like anybody else. Right. Lord means he's the boss. He's the top dog. Amen. He's the Amen. one in charge. Amen. What is it about you as a translator that would want to remove the word Lord from, the, from his name? That has to be demonic. You say, why? Uh, we'll have no king but Caesar. Uh, uh, the, uh, the devil says this, I will ascend above the stars, I will be like the most high, I'll set my throne above that. In other words, you're not going to be my Lord, you're not going to be my boss. That's written by Maverick, that's demonically inspired. If I was, if I was I'm not, if I was, if I had enough sense to be, you know, learn, do all this stuff that they need to learn to learn the text and stuff. And I was translating that thing and I came down to that thing and, 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 and I said... Well, you know, I can't really find this particular text here, and this word Lord has got to go out of the text. I believe I would tremble and say, I'm not taking that out. I don't care what any text says. Because that's part of his name. That's how you're saved. So when you take that out, you're messing with something. I'll give you just one more here. Come to uh, Jude. Now, the Lord has a... Uh, he has a... Uh, uh, what would you call it? The word's not nomenclature. He has a, he has a uh, persona about him. He's called omniscient. That means he knows everything. It's just a fancy word for saying he knows everything. All right, if he knows everything, what would be another word? What would be a synonym for knows everything? What would be a synonym for knows everything? Omniscient. Oh, okay, omniscient. Omnipresent, omniscient, knows everything. What's a, what's a synonym for that? Would you say be wise? The wise knows everything, right? 
Was that, is that a fair statement? Amen. So when he says somebody's wise, that means they know a lot, right? Look, if you will, in Jude and uh, verse 25. To the only God and our Savior be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. What's the benefit of taking a four-letter word out wise? All of them do it. The New King James leaves it in, though. They wouldn't mess with it, but the rest of the ones mess with it. Why would you take wise out? He knows everything, doesn't he? Amen. And you're referring to God, and you're saying if you're writing, if you're taking this thing down, and now they're giving, uh, um, they're giving accolades to God. They're saying, God, you're wise. And you just wipe that out and say, well, you're God. Would you want to do that? I'd be afraid to do that. But I'm wondering, how does that make the passage clearer? Isn't the purpose of all the other things to make the thing clearer for you to understand? How taking the word wise out of that makes that clearer. All right, we'll see.